kids these days. Learning stuff on computers. Back in my day, we didn't have no fancy pants touch screens with apps. Why, we did our electronic learning on this. Okay, I'll stop that. Hello. It's stupidly cold outside right now. As I read this, it's about two below zero, or minus 19 metric degrees, which means the heat pump video needs to be delayed. I told you that might happen. I'm not going out there to film anything till it's at least a little warmer. If you're here in the future or don't have the context, don't worry, I'll put a card up there when it's out. And the context is simply that I said it would be coming soon in the last video. Linear time sure is pesky. Today, though, we are going to talk about this old educational toy of mine. Could you tell that I caught my hand on my sleeve? Was it that bad? Now, unlike a certain toaster, I'm not about to attempt convincing anyone that this is better than today's educational tech, be it an iPad, Chromebook, or whatever. Those are wonderful learning tools, and they've very much come in handy recently. Well, for some kids, anyway. It's a complicated mess, I know that, but I'm not here to explore that. Just this silly thing. It's yellow! And very clever, which is why I like it. This is the GeoSafari Junior, a revision of the original GeoSafari that, as far as I can tell, is essentially the same thing, but with a different color and slightly different design. It has been surprisingly difficult to get information about this thing's history. Educational Insights is the company responsible for manufacturing it, and they're still around. But its genesis is very unclear. For instance, its name. Why is it called GeoSafari? It has very little to do with geography or safaris, as you'll soon see. Someone has written on Wikipedia that this is the brainchild of the National Geographic Society, and that Educational Insights manufactured it for them. That might help explain its name, but I can't find any source to corroborate that, nor is there any mention of National Geographic on its box. Further adding to the confusion is that Educational Insights used the GeoSafari brand on many other things, including software. In fact, the GeoSafari has what some might call the misfortune of being featured in Microsoft Bob, along with an actual geography quiz for once. Hi, it's me from the future! By rigorously analyzing this box, as shown in LGR's video on Microsoft Bob, I've been able to conclude that the original GeoSafari does appear to have been geography-focused, and that the junior version was a way to extend the device's abilities and appeal to a younger audience. However, the decision to keep calling it GeoSafari remains slightly odd. I suppose they had achieved decent enough brand recognition to stick with the name, and in the next section you'll see that the name is still alive. And that's actually how I realized nobody knows anything about this. See, on the Wikipedias, somebody claimed Educational Insights actually created Microsoft Bob, and they even have a citation for that. I mean, it's wrong. Clearly this doesn't say that Educational Insights created Bob. It just talks about the GeoSafari game included in it. And GeoSafari Jr. is alive and well, but as a brand having nothing to do with this product. For instance, here's the GeoSafari Jr. Kids Scope. So yeah, what's going on? Who knows? I reached out to Educational Insights about the history of all this, and hopefully they get back to me. This is filler that I'm writing now, just in case they don't. It helps with pacing, see? I figure if they do get back to me, then this will be a rather acceptable length of text for their answer. If they didn't, well, that's a shame, but hopefully somebody in the comments will know somebody that knows. Anyway, the specifics of its history aside, let's talk about how this thing works. The user interface is pretty basic, essentially just a number pad with a large enter key and three other buttons. Clear. Uh, and the Knowledge button. We'll get there. To the left of the keypad is a simple LED display with some instructions to its left, and LEDs to help guide the user, and a power switch and volume control. Up the sides of this large blank space are 26 red rectangular LEDs, 13 on each side. When you power it on, it makes a pleasant greeting noise and says, Hi! Well, hello! Nice to meet you! The LED beside Enter Code Number is now flashing. Now, if it seems like something is missing here, well, that's because it is. 
the large blank space is in fact a holder for the various games it can play. They come in the form of these large cards, and the designers were nice enough to include a storage pocket for them right on the back. You'll see that in the top right of each card is a code number. When the card is placed on the Geo Safari, you'll see that there are now items that line up with the various LEDs on the sides. And that's how the games or quizzes work. Entering the code tells it what game you are playing. Assuming it was a valid code, it'll then ask you if you would like one or two players. Then, because what game isn't fun unless it's also a little stressful, you give yourself a time limit, and your opponent does as well if playing with two players. Now an arrow lights up to indicate which player is up, and the knowledge button starts flashing. For clarity, I'm calling it the knowledge button. For all I know, it's called Gerald. When you hit the knowledge button, the game goes beep boop beepity boopity like any good late 80s, early 90s thing should, and the lights, they go a blinkin'. It will randomly select one item, and now it's up to you to answer the question correctly. If you do, you get a nice celebrational melody. If you don't... Real quick, I wanted to find out if the tones it produces during the question shuffling are tied to each light, or if it's random. Let's find out. Well, looks like it's random. Anyway, if you answer incorrectly, you lose a point. See, up here it tells you how many points are possible in the game. You can try again, but you only get three chances. On the third incorrect answer, it shows you the correct answer and the knowledge button lights again, inviting you to move on. At the end of the game, it plays a ditty. Which ditty? Tell us, Will! They've included a fun Easter egg, too. If you play a perfect game, the melody is extended and the lights do this fun celebrational display. Now this is pure excellence in design. Now let's talk about these last two special buttons. C is short for clear, and its function is pretty clear. It allows you to clear something that you've entered in error. No harm done. The uh, button is for when you give up and just want it to tell you the correct answer. If you use this question mark adorned button, you forfeit all the points from that question because that's what you deserve, cheater! Although this device is very simple, and I think it's fair to say crude by 2021 standards, in some ways its simplicity allows it incredible flexibility. The variety of concepts that are explored in these games is immense. For example, there are simple vocabulary exercises, but sometimes there's an extra component, such as learning the forms of baby animals. That tadpole's a real sneaky one. Also, goats and sheep? Dastardly. But I suppose it's never too early to get your kids and lambs straight. But there's so much more. I feel like this was one of those cases where a limitation, that being the device's form factor and simple operation, led to a surprising amount of creativity. Beyond simple vocab, there's identifying shapes, reading descriptions to pick out which closet belongs to which kid, you've got spatial reasoning, wowie zowie, you can learn what tools to use for measuring things, or basic units themselves. As you can see, aversion to the metric system is indoctrinated at a very young age. This is where it all starts, folks. There are games around pattern recognition, learning the basics of agriculture with fun facts to boot, action words, counting money, optical illusions, and even basic science concepts like discerning between organic and inorganic materials. It's really neat. The creators and artists did a great job making these visually appealing to 90s kids, as well as helping their parents understand what skill each game was meant to develop, with descriptions like visual sequencing, matching silhouettes, discriminating between properties, and even matching inventions to their animal inspirations. That's a very important skill, as is the flip side, matching animals to their lunches. Actually, uh, this one is kind of important. Anyway, it's neat, isn't it? As far as the way the games are structured, there are in fact only two kinds of game this can play. 
Either the game will ask for the correct number as some sort of matching exercise, or it will be a multiple choice question with up to four possible answers. And again, while that seems limiting at first glance, it's actually not really. You can implement either one in various ways. For instance, matching can be literal simple matching, but it can also be used for fill-in-the-blank type scenarios, math exercises like in the money game, or even wordplay exercises like these, which are apparently called rebus puzzles. This just taught me something. Multiple choice, while only allowing the answers 1, 2, 3, or 4, is actually even more flexible. With multiple choice, you can either have a game where the same question is asked of multiple items, for instance, does this key have a match or not, or which category does this belong to, and that itself can be done in lots of different ways, like here with this anagram exercise. But you can also pose a different question with each item, such as this case with identifying objects or judging optical illusions. These games all have the same multiple choice syntax, if you will, but the implementations are so different, you wouldn't likely notice. And that's why I love this thing. It hits that perfect sweet spot between cleverness, simplicity, ingenuity, and flexibility. And of course, it's just littered with LEDs, none of which are blue, so that's guaranteed to make me happy. One thing that I wanted to find out, though, was how those codes work. It seemed plausible that the game would have a database of some sort, and that these codes called up stored games. But on second thought, that seemed kind of dumb. After all, surely they'd want to sell you more of these games at a later date. So the codes actually define the parameters of the game. It was pretty easy to figure this out. First, there are different games with the same code. Compare these two, and you'll find that the answers are the same for each given position. There are multiple duplicates like this, but it's not like that would really matter, and in any case, the content in the middle can be shuffled around to mask it. But the dead giveaway was this card that I've apparently never noticed before, a make-your-own game with blank everything. Sadly, I don't have the manual for this and haven't been able to find it online. I'd love to get into the specifics of exactly how this coding scheme works. Alas, we'll just have to not. Someone named Donna Young runs a website which has some downloadable guides on this subject. But to access them, I need to create some sort of an account. And like, there could be a paywall for all I know, and I just didn't need that right now. So just know that the codes were literally encoding the game's parameters, okay? We can live with that, can't we? I think so. Besides, someone will probably pop into the comments to answer this within a few hours of this going live. Anyway, the last thing I want to do is take this thing apart and explore its insides. I don't expect they'll be all that interesting, but maybe there's some hidden secrets in here or something. Maybe it'll have the location of Jimmy Hoffa in there. You never know. But for this part, we're going to go scriptless for a change. Now I'll record an outro, which will go after I do this next part. Movie magic! Hey, it's the unscripted part. We're going to take this apart. That's about it. Before we do, though, this takes six D cells. Uh, not very important, but now you know. Apparently I left it on. It has some sort of auto power saving mode where if you leave it on for very long, it will turn off, but I imagine it is draining some power because that is a physical switch. So uh, you can't see it because of the way the lighting is situated, but this is very translucent and it looks like the back comes off first, so we're going to tackle that first. One thing that I've done is I've shot all the B-roll that I need before I'm doing this, just in case I break it. I don't think I'm going to, but you know. Good to be prepared. Oh, and these screws are different lengths. Yay. The two shorter ones go in the middle, the top middle. Your eyes are there, not there. My eyes are there, your eyes are there. Oh, by the way, there is a label on the back that says Made in China for Educational Insights. No mention of National Geographic. Again, I don't think they had any part in this. Oh, and there is a plug for an AC adapter back here. Makes sense. I just never noticed that. There are what look to be some clips here, so I think 
the back is locked into the bottom, I'm gonna try to remove it. There's two more tricky screws. This is why you don't force things because you're probably just being silly. There we go. There are two circuit boards going up the sides and those would have the LEDs. How difficult will it be to remove them? We will find out. Well, it's just a bunch of LEDs. I, I, um, I'm sure this is not shocking. Uh, no support components, just LEDs. It's an interesting detail that the plastic here is just like melted. Like they slipped this in underneath this goopy bit. There is some very old dust falling out of here. That's cool. You know, when Honda made their first hybrid vehicle, I'm sure they learned some things. So those were educational insights. That's really weird how they've done the, uh, the wires for the battery terminals are like underneath this thing that's been melted down, it looks like. So they've used the actual uh, plastic of the case as a sort of hot glue. I'm just gonna set this over to the side. And I'm somewhat surprised because I thought this might be too old for this practice, but there's just a blob. I was hoping there might be some discrete ICs that we could see. And there probably are on the other side. I'll try to remove it. But the most impressive thing, and I knew this would have an actual speaker, not a piezo buzzer in here just by the sound, is that it has an actual little tiny speaker. It's the sound quality of the boops is quite good. Okay, here we go. Here we go. We got it. Here's the board. We've got the LED display, which I don't know if this would be custom. Oh, it's socketed. I don't know if it's worth trying to remove it, but it's actually, it's in some sort of a socket. But anyway, there's the LED display. Can you even see this? It's in frame, barely, I think. I'll give you some other, some other close-ups, but We've got the LED display, the four LEDs there, the volume potentiometer, the power switch, and mainly what's on here is a bunch of transistors. And this fairly low. Oh, so that was a heat sink. That's what this was. Probably the power transistor for the speaker. Why did they think it needed a heat sink? It's not like it buzzes all the time. Let me see if I can confirm that that's what that is. Oh, you know what? It's probably, I'm thinking it's probably a voltage regulator now that I think about it. So maybe it does get warm enough. And surely if, if it has an AC adapter, it probably needs one. I'll take a picture of that component and find out. Here's some movie magic for you. Yes, that's a voltage regulator. So the speaker is driven by the other transistors. See, I recorded both. That way I can look it up later. But I think that's it for taking it apart. Now let's finish out the video. So that's the Geo Safari Junior a really intriguing device that demonstrates what a little ingenuity, a simple electronic game, and a bit of cardstock can do. While the blank canvas of a touchscreen certainly lends more opportunities for fun and games than this thing ever did, there's just something about this device that tickles my fancy. Sure, I'm nostalgic for it, but even now, making this video, I'm impressed with the variety of concepts it explored with nothing but a bit of paper and totally rad graphic design. Oh, and I also love the little things they used to do back in the day, like put a fake speaker grill here on this side to make you think this is in stereo. <laughs> Such a classic. Nothing like stereo boops and beeps. Anyway, thanks for watching. Heat pumps should be next, and I hope you're pumped about that hot topic. Okay, I'll go. If you're here in the future, don't worry. Well, maybe you should worry. Actually, that's a problem. How are you in the future? We gotta get Picard on this. <clears throat> I'm not here to talk about, oh God, fraud, fraud, fraud. And now it's up to you to answer the question correctly. If you do, you'll get a nice celebrational sound.
<laughs> there are games around pattern recognition, learning the basics of agriculture, action words, counting money, optical illusions, and even basic science. <laughs> we screwed up the order. Okay, learning the basics of agriculture. Some of the is things like identifying shapes. The inscriptions to pick up what closet belongs to what kid, flip it around, have spatial reasoning, wowie zowie, and learn what tools use for measuring things. There are games around pattern recognition, learning the basics of agriculture, action words, counting money, optical illusions, and even this. Okay, I think we've got it. Words, counting money, optical illusions, and even basic science concepts like discerning between organic and inorganic materials. We did it! <laughs>